Come up on 2020 ID. A tale of love, lies, videotape, and... Charged with premeditated murder, kidnapping, and poisoning. An explosive teenage love triangle that started in high school. We'd go out, we'd go on dates, we texted all the time. And ended in a shallow grave. This is an enemy burial. This is indifference to life. Two boys, best friends, vying for the same girl and even killing for her. This is a story as old as time. He has an obsession with getting her back. We'll take you inside the mind of a teenage killer. From psychotic secret journals. It sounds like the mind of a sociopath. They will kill your dog and then they'll help you find it. To surveillance cameras and the police interrogation room. I'm gonna be honest, I wanted to hurt him, like really hurt him. To caught on tape, buying a shovel, duct tape and sleeping pills. A murderer's startup kit. One way or the other, that kid was dying that day. Two's company, three's a crime. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's been said that love hurts, and a high school breakup may be the most painful of all. For many teens, going away to college provides a chance to heal, to get away, start a new life. But what happens when someone can't let go? As Matt Gutman first reported in 2014, for three high school friends, jealous rage would end in tragedy on a desolate patch a world away from where this innocent love story first began. It's a twisting obstacle course through swamp and thicket. Still, Carlos Aguilar knows this rutted drive like a father knows the contours of his son's face. It's a route he's driven so many times, leading to the site where the body of his teenage son, Christian, was discovered. This dirt track is getting narrower and narrower. It's amazing that anybody found this body. We've been following Carlos now for almost 30 minutes off of State Road 24 in the wooded wastelands of Northern Florida. The road is not that bad. This road? Yeah. No, it's not that bad, but it's not easy. Yeah, now you've seen this, you know that it was impossible for, for us, even with 500 people, to find it. This hard-working immigrant family from Colombia fucking weeds and wetting the earth with their tears considers this sacred ground. There's a cross with rosary beads. The name Chris is spray-painted on a nearby rock. He's like a father's dream. Yes, the name of Christian means a gift from God. So it was a gift from God. You said that God has been with you with the grief. He chose this cross for me. Life wasn't supposed to end here so soon for the 18-year-old scholar with the dancing eyes and the megawatt smile. What was your brother like? He was shy with people he didn't know, but once he got to know you, he would just open up. He would just start cracking jokes, start telling you things about himself, just any way to get you to laugh. He would try to find a way. So how did Christian Aguilar end up in this marshland, bound, face down in a shallow grave what the cops call an enemy-style burial. This was some type of nefarious act. Somebody was trying to conceal the body of a person. We find that most generally in, in cases of murder. It's a story that made headlines up and down the Florida Turnpike. A search is underway for missing University of Florida student And Christine. got national attention. I still feel my son is still alive in my heart. The twisted murder mystery started at this elite charter school in Miami. Christian Aguilar was known for his easygoing cool, his charisma, and his taste for hip hop. I get it custom. You a customer, you ain't... So that's one thing that you and Christian have always shared is love of hip hop and specifically Kanye. I mean, to this day, I still love Kanye West. So, hmm. yeah, you know, we would just hop in his car, go with him to his house, hang out for a while. At the time, Erica Freeman was dating Christian's close friend, class clown, Pedro Bravo. So tell me more about Pedro in high school. He was always quite sarcastic, quite funny. He was able to make me laugh so easily. He was very much an animal lover. I mean, he liked action movies, you know, he liked superheroes. The beauty with the big hazel eyes is the center of Pedro's world. We'd go out, we'd go on dates, we um, texted all the time, we'd call. Um, 
You know, we celebrated our anniversaries, we celebrated birthdays. Did you say you loved each other? Yes, we did. We did say we loved each other. And for a long time, I thought that was kind of what love was like. It seemed their love is built to last. I mean, not many relationships go almost three years, but... Especially not in high school. Yeah, it's, it's kind of unheard of. Christian Aguilar was part of the couple's clique. They all go to prom together. But as graduation approaches, Pedro and Erica's puppy romance is almost over. At one point, you decided that this relationship wasn't working for you. Yes, I did. I had talked to him about it. I was like, you know, maybe we should go on a break. I don't, I don't think I'm happy. I felt like he almost manipulated me at that point in my life. Erica breaks up with Pedro, and abruptly, the class clown's laughter is replaced with tears. He was very emotional about it. He was very, you know, he, he cried a lot. He was very, I mean, it was not what I was expecting at all when I broke up with him. So when you broke up with Pedro, somewhere in your mind were you thinking, well, maybe I could start something with Christian? Um, there was a little part of me that kind of hoped that, you know, Christian made me really happy and we had so many things in common, but a larger part of me was like, you know, it's never going to happen. She would leave Pedro behind to attend Santa Fe Community College in Gainesville and study biology. Coincidentally, Christian is heading to Gainesville also, but to the swamp. Home of the orange and blue. University of Florida Gators. His future full of promise. He has a scholarship, gets financial aid, and plans to study biomedical engineering. And when he and Erica run into each other in Gainesville, suddenly sparks fly. It was crazy. We had these smiles on our faces from ear to ear, and I mean, we just looked at each other and like with these dumb faces, like, is this really happening? Like, we kept having to look at each other, and we couldn't, we didn't even know what to say. You know, we just sat there in happiness. That sounds like true love in a way. I think we were soulmates. Erica has moved on. Her ex has not. Abandoning his plans to study engineering at a college in Miami and moving to Gainesville to enroll in Erica's college. When is the first time that you realize, oh man, Pedro's in Gainesville? He actually sends me a text message and I'm kind of thinking, oh, this, is, this doesn't sound normal you know um no one just packs up all their stuff and moves to a different city you know so far from the family for a girl no it wasn't normal neither was the journal pedro kept a brooding meditation on his quest to win erica back no one will stop me he wrote i will get out of miami and into gainesville and i will get her back I just was kind of like, oh my God, what what are we gonna do? Should we tell him? Should we not tell him? Should we, you know, should we just live our lives and kind of if he meet, sees us or meets us or something, we'll worry about it then. 2020 obtained that journal and sketchbook, which would prove central to the story. In it, Pedro's personal and meticulous self-help plan to get rid of acne, whiten his teeth, and even wear a red shirt because he thinks it will be more eye-catching to the opposite sex. His handwritten musings winding around seemingly unrelated sketches of cartoon characters, monsters, and sometimes sentimental doodlings. They almost look like he could have been a cartoonist. You know, I mean, they're very beautiful pieces of art. His drawings, what kind of drawings were they? I just saw, you know, pictures of hearts. There was captions next to the hearts. Um, you know, there were broken hearts. Um, and hearts in tiny pieces. Adding insult to injury, Pedro now hears through the grapevine that his true love's heart now belongs to one of his best friends, Christian. The journal revealing his increasing anguish. I feel as if someone stabbed me and I bleed it out and died. I want her back, please, I'll give anything. It's September 7th, and this is the 34th Street Wall. Erica agrees to meet Pedro here. It's a place where for years UF students have come to paint graffiti, but this is an awkward moment at best because right away Pedro asks her if she's dating Christian. She says no. He confronted you with the pictures of you and Christian. He showed me a picture of me standing next to Christian, and I was just like, listen, um, 
we're friends, you know, we're hanging out, we know we're not dating, we're just hanging out. But you lied to him. I did lie to him, yes. I. Why did you lie? I just felt like it wasn't the appropriate time to tell him that. You know, I don't want to push this kid at all. I don't want him to think anything, you know, that might throw him over the edge. But Pedro is spinning out of control. He's even been talking suicide. And then curiously, he calls Christian for help. Pedro calls Christian on a payphone. And he's like, I'm really depressed. And I was wondering if we can talk, you know, so maybe you can give me advice about how to deal with this, you know, depression. Did he ask you if he should go, what you thought? We were a little concerned that maybe he would try to fight him or something of that sense. But, you know, we talked about it. You know, you're going to meet on UF campus. Um, you're going to be fine. They met at The Hub, the college bookstore here at the heart of this throbbing campus of the University of Florida. What happened soon after will change three lives forever. I started calling him. I started texting him. He was not answering. I was kind of like, well, you know, I got to do something. I have to do something. Stay with us. The body of college freshman Christian Aguilar has been found in the swamplands outside Gainesville. The last person known to see him, friend and romantic rival, Pedro Bravo. But there were other eyes on the young men that day with their own story to tell. Matt Gudman picks up the story. Let's face it, we live in the United States of surveillance, where every moment from the shocking and the trivial to the outrageous and mundane is an open target for exposure. And on September 20th, 2012, almost every moment of Pedro Bravo's day was captured in the bitter grays of surveillance cameras. He and Christian met at 1.39 p.m., head to lunch, then go to this Best Buy. A receipt shows Christian bought a Kanye West CD with cash and used his rewards card. At 4.11 that afternoon, Bravo drives his friend to this parking lot. The two sit in Bravo's navy blue blazer at this spot. No one gets in or out of the vehicle. About two and a half hours later, security cameras show Bravo pulling out of that Walmart parking lot. Christian Aguilar is never seen alive again. If you hear that the last person that was with your son was your son's girlfriend's ex-boyfriend, you kind of link one or two together. We all started having our doubts and suspicions. Now, at the same time that Pedro was being tagged by all that surveillance, Erica Freeman was frantically trying to find Christian. I kept texting him and kept calling him, and it was really strange that he wasn't answering. It, wasn't, it just wasn't like him. I mean, I'm trying to calm myself down, you know, yeah, yeah, there's, per there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. You know, he's going to show up tomorrow, and I'm going to, we're going to be fine. But back at Pedro's apartment, what security cameras pick up next was suspicious and disturbing. Bravo arrives, then immediately leaves his apartment. Where he goes next is an issue of contention because 30 minutes into his drive, he deliberately turns his phone to airplane mode. So he puts it in airplane mode where his phone is going to be detected. Ken Brennan is a private investigator hired by 2020 to review the case. He's sharp enough to know. You know, the police can triangulate cell phones. He's off the grid for about five hours before surveillance cameras capture him at a nearby McDonald's, picking up a Big Mac and a Dr. Pepper before finally heading home. He knows that I want to dump the body and I want to dump it far enough away from where the crime occurred. So he wants to get the body out of Gainesville, far enough away where it's in another jurisdiction. It's a lot harder for the police to investigate a crime that's outside their jurisdiction than one in their own. 4 a.m. in the morning, and Christian is still missing. I call Pedro, and it starts ringing, and it's ringing, it's ringing, and then finally he answers, and, you know, the first thing I'm asking him was, like, where's Christian? You know, where is he? I know you were the last person that was with him. You know, where is he? I'm really worried. He's, he, you know, he's supposed to be at my apartment, and he's not here, and I haven't heard from him. And he's just like, no, you know, I dropped him off. You know, we got into a verbal argument, and, you know, I'm freaking out. And he's just like, you know, listen, you know, it's late. I'm sure he made it home. He just didn't call you. By daybreak, Erica is panicking. You call his apartment. He's not there. He's not at your place either. And I really start to panic because I'm like, he didn't sleep here all night. You know, he wasn't at my apartment. He wasn't in his dorm apartment. You know, where was he all night? 
you know. I call Pedro and at this time I'm not asking him, I'm telling him like, listen, you need to come with me to the police station. 9.44 in the morning and both Erica Freeman and Pedro Bravo go to the campus police station to report their friend is missing. Sergeant Steve Wilder was suspicious from the get-go. When you first saw Pedro Bravo come in there, into that room, what was your first impression? It didn't take long of interacting with him and talking to him that I knew that there was really something that he was holding back. I don't, I don't know where he is. At what point do you begin being suspicious of Pedro? Honestly, we even walked into the police station and I still didn't think Pedro was capable of doing something so horrendous. I mean, this guy that's, you know, shy and, you know, he wouldn't hurt a fly, you know, he loves animals and, you know, he's hard working in school. Never seen violent. Never seen violent. Pedro says he came here to help, but everything that comes out of his mouth only cements his status as the prime suspect. We're uh, finding out new stuff that you haven't talked to me about before. But I had to tell you I was in that area. At first, Pedro tells investigators that he left Aguilar in the woods, not far from Walmart, after arguing with him in the car. I told you everything I know. And I just go away, like, while he was still there. But with every question, a new variation in his story. At one point, he even introduces the possibility of a new suspect, a mysterious hitchhiker they picked up in a rough part of town. How old do you think he was? I'd say mid-50s, but I can't tell because he had a big, white, bushy beard. And Pedro now claims that after dropping the hitchhiker off, he and Christian got into a fight, not about Erica, but about another girl they knew in high school. He's striking one ground with his hand. What? No blood. He was already bleeding. Strike him with the other hand, right? Yes. Slide the cheek. Do you know if he was breathing at all? Or? I, I remember he was, like, he wasn't struggling to breathe as much, but he was barely breathing. It had gone from, well, I punched him one time and made him get out of the car, to I forced him out of the car, punched him repeatedly, to I punched him repeatedly, landed on top of him, punched him again repeatedly, and left him unconscious, but still breathing. I'm going to be honest, but I wanted to hurt him, like, Really for doing that. He can see by his gestures and the, the motions that he's making that they both understand each other where the suspect realizes I'm with a guy who's been around for a long time and he knows what's up. I might be able to BS other people, but this guy knows better. All the 10 or 15 minutes and you ever try to crawl away or... They're not. Was there a moment during that interrogation that you looked at Bravo and said, I'm speaking to a murderer? I knew certainly after speaking with him for just a few minutes that, that I was speaking with someone who was trying to be extremely deceptive. You saw Pedro Bravo. He's not a very big guy. And when you think of him knocking somebody who's eight inches taller than him out of the car and beating him up, what do you think? They have that old saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Too much fun. Not much fun. Because I was aiming more for bruises than blood. Because I had that negative experience around blood. Because <laughs> the, the last time they took blood for me, I, I like I had what was it? I had a seizure. When he starts fumbling over himself and he yeah. starts coming up with these <laughs> stories, they know they got the right guy. Now it's a matter of gathering the evidence enough to be able to con to to arrest this guy and then ultimately to convict them. After eight hours of interrogation and rambling answers, Pedro has still not confessed to any crime, but tellingly, he keeps referring to Christian in the past tense. He was a really good friend. We know that he's not coming back, okay? You know he's not coming back. Look at that again, a subtle but fateful nod of the head. And with that, the case against Pedro Bravo has begun. You have the right to remain silent. And so has the search for Christian Aguilar's body. Christian! It was the largest and most publicized search in Gainesville history. Hundreds of people, friends, family, volunteers, even psychics, combing 10 square miles of woods and ditches in search of clues. I'm looking for people's heart that can come and help me. I'm looking for somebody that can walk with me. Uh, that's the only thing that I'm asking.
God, today we come before you and we pray for the Aguilar family. Candlelight vigils pop up for the missing team in Gainesville, Miami, the family's native Columbia. We had hope of finding him. I mean, it slowly started going away when you're reaching day four and five and you're no trace of him. So you knew that he was dead, but you were not willing to accept the fact that he was going to remain missing. Yes. Eight days after Christian's disappearance, even though no body has been discovered, the state charges Bravo with kidnapping and first degree murder. It was strange um, for us to even come to terms with it. And as time went by, I kept, it was like nudging in the back of my head, you know, Pedro must have been involved, Pedro must have been involved. And it, it was sickening almost just because, you know, we, we knew him for so long and, you know, Christian was his friend, and I'm just there, like, you know, crying, crying, and we we're just feeling like, you know, he's he's not going to come back. We're not going to, we're not going to ever see him again. Knowing that Christian's family and the love of his life are all in agony, Pedro still offers no information about his friend's whereabouts. Then, 22 days after his mysterious disappearance, two hunters in search of firewood found Christian's body in the swamplands 60 miles southwest of Gainesville. A body found east of Cedar Key. The Aguilar family tells us they feel like it's their son. They tell me, you know, listen, the search is over. You know, they they found him, Christian's, Christian's gone. And I mean, now I'm starting to shake. And it was like this sense of, of relief and at the same time, the sense of overwhelming pain. When we come back, lights. 48 minutes, he uses his flashlight out there. Camera. You know he's not coming back. And courtroom action to prove how the young freshman taught himself murder 101. Stay with us. As life in the college town of Gainesville rolls on, investigators spent two years building their murder case against Pedro Bravo. Erica burying her grief in her studies. She was majoring in biology at Santa Fe Community College. During all this time, I felt like Christian was kind of near us, kind of watching over us. And I felt like he was there with us, trying to trying to comfort us, trying to give us, you know, you know, it's gonna be okay. All rise for the jury. Let the record reflect that Mr. Bravo is present in the courtroom with his counsel. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. But when the trial finally begins, the defendant is very much on the defense. Charged with premeditated murder, kidnapping, and poisoning. His high school friend, you have student Christian Aguilar in the trial of Santa Fe student Pedro Bravo. Pedro Bravo and Christian Aguilar were high school amigos. But all that ended when Christian swept Pedro's former girlfriend, Erica Freeman, off her feet. It was a very passionate person, very romantic. I love that about him. I love everything about him. I used to tell him, I was like, you know, the world can end right now, and if I'm in your arms, I don't care. Now, Pedro stands accused of murdering Christian, and it looks like there's a mountain of evidence to prove it. With all of this evidence amassed against him, he's got a very narrow opportunity to tell a story that's even remotely plausible. From the outset, the prosecution pulls no punches, painting Bravo as a jealous rival plotting revenge against his former friend. This is a story as old as time, the classic story, the Cain and Abel story, the elimination of a rival fueled by jealousy, hatred, anger. He has an obsession with her. He has an obsession with getting her back. Erica takes center stage as the prosecution asks her to recount her story. I knew I was leaving and I told him that I was not happy and I did not want to continue doing a long distance relationship. And now I have to have this person, this, this monster, you know, staring at me while I'm on the stand. And I can just feel myself like aching and I just don't even want to look that way. I don't want him to look at me. I don't want him to see me ever again. The prosecution presents Pedro's journals as proof of his disturbed state of mind. Page after page of teen angst and anguished obsession. When I fell for her, I fell hard. Now I can't pick myself up. I feel weak. I want her back, please. I'll give anything. I wish, I wish, I wish. There was also this self-loathing suicide note he penned in jail. 
with everyone out there wanting blood, wanting me gone, I will give them what they want. I feel terrible, and every day in here is the day spent waiting to die. I am a monster for having hurt Chris the way I did. At one point, she breaks down in tears. All of this was focused on you. You were at the center of this all. Yes, a lot of it was with his obsession for me and how he wanted me back and how he wanted to be with me. What did you think reading his journal? It sounds like the mind of a sociopath or the sick person for someone to be that selfish and that controlling, that manipulative. You know, it's almost like what they describe sociopaths, you know, they will kill your dog and then go help you find it. Prosecutors also start piling up the circumstantial evidence compiled over the two year investigation. The jury learns that just four days before Christian's disappearance, Pedro came here to a nearby Walmart and buys an ankle wrap and gets $80 cash back. He then comes to this Lowe's where he buys hot shot pesticide, a Gatorade and a shovel. Then for some reason, he heads back to that Walmart and Pedro walks in with that shovel. He purchases sleeping aids, duct tape, and a knife. He pays cash. Then there's that staple of 21st century criminology, the computer evidence. Turns out that Pedro Googled suspicious search terms such as buying anesthetics. What is chloroform and how do sleeping pills kill you? At 135, he does a search, good anesthetic chemical. At 135, he does another search, can rubbing alcohol knock someone out? The prosecution claims that days after Pedro completed his homicidal research, he arranged to meet Christian. Reporter Stephanie Bashar of ABC affiliate WCJB has been covering the story from day one. The state put together a timeline, a sequence of events where, you know, where he was from when he got together with Chris all the way to nighttime. Christian holding that Kanye West CD and Pedro right next to him. That is a picture that, you know, no one will ever forget. The two sat parked in Pedro's SUV at that Walmart. According to the prosecution, this was the scene of the gruesome murder. It claims that Bravo strangled Aguilar inside his car after knocking him out using Gatorade laced with drugs. Christian Aguilar struggles for his life. He reaches for the door. He scratches the ceiling. This is an enemy burial. This is indifference to life. And for the CSI types in the jury box, prosecutors have a cornucopia of forensic evidence. The most damning evidence against Pedro is the blood that was found inside his SUV. Blood in Pedro's car and on a pair of insoles. Christian's backpack containing his wallet was balled up inside Bravo's closet and the residue in his car matched soil samples from the site of Christian's shallow grave. And then a piece of irrefutable evidence, the tear pattern from the roll of duct tape Pedro bought at that Walmart. They literally were able to match the tears of the duct tape found on the victim's body with tears on duct tape on Pedro Bravo's own car. It is a chilling chain of evidence, but the defense argues that all of it, from the shovel and the computer searches to the poison pesticide and sleeping pills, was intended not for homicide, but for suicide. He's out there in the woods, He's drinking this concoction, threw up all over himself, and he's like, well, maybe, maybe this is a sign from God that I shouldn't do this. Pedro still needed the jury to believe that his statement to police was true. He beat Christian up, but left him alive. And now he's going to have to sell that story himself. Coming up, Pedro takes the stand. You swear or affirm any testimony you give this jury today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's why. The jailhouse snitch and the plot to use that shovel to put more victims in the ground. Stay with us. In seven days of testimony, prosecutors have presented evidence they say points to Pedro Bravo for the murder of Christian Aguilar. Defense attorneys counter that the only life Bravo wanted to take was his own. But this trial isn't over yet. A bombshell witness is about to blow open some 
closely held confidences and reveal a plot even more bizarre than the murder itself. Once again, Matt Gutman. What would a hardcore gang member know about the intimacies of a teenage love triangle? In this case, prosecutors claim quite a bit as they called to the stand a prisoner with the improbable name Michelangelo. With gun, drugs, and kidnapping charges to his name, he's a true renaissance man of crime. Are you a convicted felon? Yes, sir. Do you know how many times you've been convicted? Nine times. The plot thickened with Michelangelo's testimony. The felon shared a cell with Pedro Bravo in the fall of 2012, and when they met, Angelo dispensed with the small talk. You know, I was like, he probably killed that kid, you know. And, and what was his response to that? He really didn't answer, you know. Later, when Bravo does speak, it's of his two main preoccupations, writing and death. He'd asked me, you know, to borrow a pen and my shoelace. And I asked him what for, and he said so that he could uh, write a suicide letter to his parents and to use a shoestring to kill himself. Bravo was put on suicide watch for a few weeks. Angelo says when the young man returns, Bravo has shifted his mindset from suicidal to scheming. Now he's concocted a way to walk free. What did you think it was? Uh, a way to basically get the charges thrown out in this case or get the charges dropped against him. And did you believe it was offering you money to help? Yes, sir. Bravo's plan was to use Angelo's outside gang contacts to commit murders similar to Chris's to make it appear that a serial killer was on the loose, thus leading suspicion away from Bravo. Was it ever brought up about the shovel and what you would need to do with the shovel as part of the plan? The prosecutor keeps digging for more details, specifically about that shovel Bravo purchased. I would have to go get the shovel to, uh, I guess, copycat that murder to make it look like somebody else had did it. But Angelo has a plan of his own. He cut a deal with prosecutors to become a jailhouse snitch, earning Bravo's trust and extracting incriminating details like these. He said that he was going to try to poison him with a, a mixture of sleeping pills and pesticide mixed with soda. And uh, his backup plan was to have a knife, you know, to cut his throat. And the, his main plan was to choke him with a moving strap. Eventually, Michelangelo completes his masterpiece, a full confession from Bravo on the Aguilar family must now endure as the last moments of their son's life play out in graphic detail. He told me that he, you know, basically put a moving strap around the kid's neck and uh, braced himself against the seat. He, he said that uh, he remembers watching the radio, the clock on the radio, and said it took like 13 minutes for the kid to, you know, I guess die. Did he ever make any comment to you about security guards at Walmart? Yeah, he, uh, at one point he said that he kind of got freaked out because while he was holding onto the strap that, uh, the security guard had rode by. Angelo is a full service snitch. He even leads cops to the hidden location of that now infamous shovel. Did he in fact tell you where the shovel was located? He said a, a wooden walkway bridge type thing. Isn't it the truth you had not yet Bravo's defense says Angelo's credibility is shot since he was testifying in exchange for a reduced sentence. But can they overcome all that video? Surveillance video of Spyglass Apartments, surveillance video of Walmart. You can see the two together. With all that physical evidence piling up against him, the most important defense witness in this trial was Pedro Bravo himself. In fact, the 20 year old is the only witness the defense calls. There were some reporters that even squealed. I mean, and, and two of them gasped. Everybody was very much waiting for that moment. As his parents look on stoically, Bravo tries to charm the jurors, resurrecting the old class clown, conversational, even jovial at times. Bravo describing his last ditch effort to win Erica back. I still loved her. And I really wanted to get back with her, so uh, other than getting my classes done, I also had a set idea that I'm going to go get her back. If I keep telling myself, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. 
But what exactly was the this? Bravo admits that when he discovered that Erica was dating Christian, he snaps. They've been going out for about like two, three weeks. And at that moment, I'm just instantly like, I'm crushed I'm, because he's one of my best friends. He says that as he descended into a life of despair, he was consumed by thoughts of suicide that had plagued him for years. I was too nervous to do anything with knives because I don't like pain. And um, I couldn't bring myself to hang myself or anything like that. So the only way I could see it was um, I tried to take some pills, see what would happen. But lo and behold, I'm still here. Speaking of suicide, remember that shovel? Bravo says he can explain that away too. Tell the jury why you bought a shovel. It was going to be part of my idea to kill myself. In a way, I was going to go find the spot, and I was going to mark my tomb, and I was going to dig it. Even as the prosecution goes over his version of events with dripping sarcasm, Bravo remains cool. Now, you're on your way to kill yourself, right? Correct. But you got to get gas first, right? Correct. Okay, because you can't kill yourself without a tank of gas, correct? Correct. And now, Pedro's biggest challenge is keeping all of his stories straight. It seems like Pedro was changing his story to make it a little more believable, depending on the evidence out there. One piece of testimony that Pedro tries to finesse deals with the end of his encounter with Christian, the alleged scuffle that began inside the SUV as the two boys argued over Freeman. His friend's nose now bloodied. Bravo claims he pulled in here behind this motorcycle shop. Now, the two start fighting. They tumble out of the car. And at this point, he claims things got really heated. As I exit the car, he comes up and something went through my head. And I just, I got mad and I basically pushed him. As I pushed him, I followed behind him and I swept him off his feet. As he fell down, I fell on top of him as well. Bravo claims that's the last time he ever saw Christian. He was alive and above ground. All I, I could tell was that he didn't get up right away, but that he was still moving. Still breathing? Yes. He just left his best friend there. It would make sense he just wants to get away from that and drive a little bit. Should he have not left him? Of course not. But he, he did that, and it's wrong, and now he's driving. But here's the thing. So much of this story was captured by security cameras. But the one piece of video Pedro needs to be on tape simply doesn't exist. We don't know of any surveillance video that shows the two had an encounter or a fight. No video. And for 22 days, no Aguilar. Until his body is discovered face down in that shallow grave, buried, as cops say, enemy style. The defense really tried to come up with a credible story. Now, do we believe that? I'm not sure. But what does the jury believe? We're about to find out because as we're conducting this interview, a voice from the courthouse calls out. Like Pedro wrote it. Let's go. We got a verdict. The verdict is next. Judgment Day for Pedro Bravo. The Aguilar family hustles in for a decision. Carlos, the anxious patriarch, needs a moment to gather himself. Everybody is starting now to move back into the courtroom. Christian Aguilar's family has gathered here en masse. All day, Carlos has looked very calm. But right now, this is the tensest we've seen him. This is the culmination of two years for him. It has already been a long day for the family. Nearly eight hours of closing arguments. The prosecution and defense taking their last shots at a jury of eight women and four men. I think you'll find you find that the fight did happen at strikes. You find that the law enforcement did nothing to check out whether or not the fight happened at strikes. And when you do that, I think you'll find my client not guilty. The prosecution says Bravo's the mastermind of a murderous plot, reminding the jury of Pedro's police interrogation and his curious choice of the past tense. Throughout the interview, he says, and refers to Chris was a good friend. He is the only person on the planet who knows that Chris is in the past tense. As the jury takes the case to the deliberation room, all the Aguilar family can do is wait and worry.
there's th that moment when the jury's deliberating that you're just thinking, what's taking them so long? What happens if they find something? What happens if there is a reasonable doubt? There are nine days of testimony and more than 1,000 pieces of evidence to consider. But after a mere three hours, the jury is back. We, the jury, finds as follows as the defendant, Pedro Andreas Bravo, in this case, as to count one, the defendant is guilty of felony murder, first degree. Bravo stone-faced after being found guilty of all charges. The Aguilar family, always respectful inside the courtroom, takes to the hallways for a rare moment of catharsis. Alexander, how do you feel? I don't know if I can really describe this. The judge said this is your day of reckoning to Bravo. Do you think life in prison is enough for him? I think that that's the maximum that he can pay for the life of my son. Later, they return to remind the judge of the toll this case has taken on them. I cannot express how our life were destroyed on September 20 by the acts of Mr. Bravo. I cannot tell you or quantify the pain that we have going through. Their brief moment of relief comes to an abrupt halt as the killer gets one last twist of the knife. I know in my heart that I did not do anything to hurt my friend to put him beyond that point and cause him to die. I know in my heart what I did, and I know God knows what I did. So I'll take whatever sentence is given to me, be it life, life without parole, and I will do it. You know, this was a person we knew. This was intentional. Not, none of this had to happen. This was your friend. This had been your former love. Yes, yes. It, it just makes it all so worse. This is your day of reckoning. Judge James Colon giving him exactly what he asked. Mr. Count One, I sentence you to natural life in prison with no possibility of parole. After the verdict, family and friends go their separate ways. The Aguilars once again making that long drive to that makeshift shrine in the middle of nowhere. And the former girlfriend, she still has her whole life ahead of her just not the one she thought she'd have. I think we would have gotten married eventually. He was such a good person. He was just so kind and so considerate and so compassionate. I always feel like when I describe him, I'm never describing him enough. You know, like there's something missing. You know, you had to meet him.